Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Crisis Best Practices Workgroup. Uh, this is our July meeting. For those of you joining us for the first time, we're glad to have you um, as a part of our workgroup. Um, for our agenda today, uh, we are going to be talking about the safety net and how crisis programs function uh, as a complement to that safety net and also about instances where they are asked um, to maybe do um, more than what was initially expected of them and, and, and how programs kind of manage that dynamic. Um, so we will review the survey results from uh, the survey that was sent out a few weeks ago and then we will also talk up just do a review of our project plan and our timeline um, and then uh, adjourn our meeting and talk about uh, our next meetings coming up. Uh, so the purpose of this group is to develop a comprehensive best practice toolkit for crisis residential services, which is informed by crisis residential providers across the country. Uh, we have changed our uh, call-in information a little bit, and we're now going exclusively through the Skype phone calls and Skype app. Um, so if you are wanting to ask a question during our time together, uh, please just make sure to dial star six, which will help you to unmute yourself if you're calling through the phone, or just to hit your microphone unmute button uh, if you're going completely through the app. TBD Solutions is proud to sponsor the Crisis Best Practices Workgroup. Uh, we provide an array of services to uh, behavioral health providers and social service providers. Uh, we specialize in crisis program development and metrics development. We also offer a middle management training uh, and an array of other services. Uh, we are also now posting our uh, phone calls uh, and our conference calls to our YouTube page. So if you search TBD Solutions uh, on YouTube, you should be able to get uh, the last three or four uh, conference calls that we've had, and we will be posting this one uh, and all future calls to our YouTube page as well. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter or Facebook, we try to provide relevant information for crisis providers and for behavioral health providers um, on how to make uh, your workplace better, how to provide uh, better services, um, basically anything related to triple aim goals um, and, and, and getting the right care to the right people. Our work group continues to expand, uh, which we're really excited about. We now have 115 participants from 37 states. Uh, we estimate now that there's approximately 350 crisis homes across the country. Uh, and we welcome new participants from Hawaii and Oklahoma and Virginia. And for Hawaii and Oklahoma, those are the, f the first participants we've had from those states. So if you're joining us on the call, we're very glad to have you. Um, very excited, have had some great conversations in the last few weeks uh, from those crisis programs. Um, so great, great to hear about the work you're doing and glad to have you joining our work group. So just a quick review of the content that we've gone over up to this point. So our first call uh, that, that had a, a specific topic area focus was on staffing, and that was back in December of 2016. Um, since then, we've talked about a, a lot of different areas of service. Uh, last month, we talked about funding and how programs are, are, are currently funded and how they're trying to diversify or expand their funding streams. Uh, for those of you that were able to join our webinar this, this past week, uh, we had a great conversation with, uh, with members from the commercial health plan sides at Optum and, um, uh, and Anthem, uh, and they gave us just a great overview of some of the work that they've been able to do uh, in their communities and how they are trying to expand their benefit packages uh, to include crisis stabilization services. So this month, we are going to be talking about the safety net and how crisis programs function as a part of, of the continuum of services in your community and, and kind of what they're asked to do. And uh, as we'll see as we dive into the survey results, um, there's, a, there's quite a bit of diversity in function and scope of services from one community to the next. But I want to start to, uh, today by talking about uh, this dynamic tension between crisis services and uh, the safety net in the community. And I want to pull an example from 
uh, one of the uh, greatest movies from the 1980s, Ghostbusters. Uh, so whether or not you've seen Ghostbusters before, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of bring you up to speed on, on this situation. So uh, the Ghostbusters uh, is a team of, um, of psychologists and parapsychologists, and uh, they've, they've obviously turned into um, action-adventure heroes uh, as they try to uh, rid New York City of its ghost problem. Uh, so they're doing well. It's, it's going along well. Uh, and then a gentleman named Walter Peck comes to their office and he says, uh, I'm with the Environmental Protection Agency and I'd like to see your uh, facilities and how you trap the ghosts. Um, Peter Venkman, who's played by Bill Murray, uh, refuses to show him. Uh, and so subsequently, uh, Walter Peck comes back with uh, an order with a police officer and uh, um, uh, some sort of labor worker and says, uh, I want you to shut these machines down. They're not safe. They're not regulated. Uh, you don't have a license to do this. Um, and so subsequently, they have to shut them down. Um, the system, the, the, the city goes into chaos because all these ghosts that have been trapped are subsequently uh, released out into the city and, uh, and, and just wreaking havoc, right? The first thing that Walter Peck does is he goes back to the Ghostbusters and he, with the police and he says, arrest these men. They've created all this chaos. Even though the Ghostbusters gave in incredibly adequate warning to say, if you do this, it's going to have very grave consequences. Um, so I, I think the character of Walter Peck is interesting in this example because uh, he is making a demand that he feels like he has the authority to, to do. Uh, he has been notified by uh, the Ghostbusters, which in this case you could consider a provider of services, right? They're, they're, they're busting ghosts, of course. <laughs> um, and and he's, he's trying to come at them and make a new demand on them and saying, you're not doing something the right way. Uh, you know, you, you have to cease and desist, or you have to make this this incredible change. Uh, the Ghostbusters uh, explained to him this is not a good plan, or we're not equipped to handle the results of this plan, right? And then, uh, of course, um, uh, they let the ghosts go. Something bad happens, and then the Ghostbusters get in trouble for it, and they go to jail. Um, I think we can find some parallels here sometimes between what crisis providers are asked to do on a day-to-day -day basis um, from your funders, um, from your referral sources, uh, to make accommodations that, that you want to make because you want to be helpful, but sometimes you recognize it just might not be a good idea, or you might not have the capacity to do it, or you're not ready to handle the consequences of that idea, um, you know, n not uh, not going well, um, and, and and knowing that you're part of the safety net or, or that you manage some of the risk and and, and take that on your shoulders, uh, then you also have to deal with the consequences of a bad decision or a bad directive if it wasn't uh, something that was mutually decided upon. So we have a lot of in intensive data today. So I'm going to give a little bit more time for maybe like some extra pauses to, to let people take in the data or to ask questions about it. Um, but uh, I, I recognize in our survey, we, we got we, we used a lot of words, um, as one of my colleagues says. Um, we used a lot of words, but we're trying to really drill down to understand, you know, beyond the basics that we've asked about in, in previous uh, in, in previous conference calls you know what's different about this and what are we asking and you know like uh what is that what is that like so um the this is the results of uh the first question that we asked which we said in previous surveys we've asked about the primary functions of your crisis program so is your is your program serving any of the functions listed below as well? Okay, so in addition to just the, to a couple of those, like what else are you doing um, kind of above and beyond? So the way to read this, this uh, graph, uh, the orange area says we regularly provide this type of service. The green area says we occasionally provide this type of service. And the blue area says we rarely or never provide this type of service. So some things that stick out to me as I look at this first slide is that uh, the second uh, response from the bottom says housing assistance. 
74% of the programs that responded this month said that they provide housing assistance by completing applications, soft referrals to housing resources, et cetera. Contrast that with the first two items on our list, which are domestic violence and uh, providing respite until SUD treatment is available. Only 4% of our respondents said that they regularly provide that type of service. Okay, whereas almost six, uh, with uh, about 60% of each of those said that it's just not a common occurrence in their program. And that was the same with assisting with medical detox and uh, providing respite until housing is available. So I'll take just a second for you guys to kind of uh, take all of that information in because I know that there's a lot um, on here, uh, but just to kind of get a sense of, of how often providers are, are, are offering these types of services. And again, if you have questions as we're going along today, just press star six on your phone or unmute yourself and feel free to ask a question and uh, we will we'll, we'll do our best to, you know, give an answer. So one of the quotes from this section said, we used to provide detox, but had to stop due to a lack of nursing resources in our area. And I think that's interesting to consider uh, for those programs that have issues with hiring, um, and, and, and you wonder, are we losing our talent to other programs? Uh, a, a, another consideration might be, how big is your community? And how many psychiatric nurses is it reasonable to expect you would have in your community? Um, and is it more than just uh, like a money issue, but is it an availability issue? Um, and in this case, the, the, the participant who responded said, you know, we wanted to provide this service, but we had to make uh, we had to make a tough decision and say our staffing model can't support this and, it, and it's not sustainable and it's not good for our whole program to go down because we can't meet these needs. Uh, but instead, we, we start to define a little bit more about what we can do and what we can't do. So this is a different slide. So this kind of goes into the second half of the questions we asked about, you know, is your program serving any of these functions? Um, and you'll notice that a lot more of these answers were kind of in the uh, occasionally or rarely or never provide this service. So for example, providing respite until uh, a medically complex individual uh, can receive placement. Like that's just not, that 85% that of the homes said that's not happening. And when I say homes, I apologize. Sometimes I flip back and say homes. We just, we mean crisis programs. Uh, and in the words crisis residential, crisis stabilization, uh, crisis homes, facility-based crisis, we're all intending those to, to basically mean the same thing um, as we've kind of fleshed out in some of our previous, uh, our previous conference calls. Uh, so another uh, quote that came out of, the, of this area was, uh, a provider said, we only admit indigent, underinsured, or uninsured individuals. Our county funds more of the program, and it was specifically established to serve this grossly underserved part of our population. So that, to me, says that a, a provider is saying, this is what we do, this is what we've been called to do, almost taking like a specialty role, and, and that this is, you know, we're very intentional about the service because there was a need for it and we're, we're addressing it or we're responding to it in the way uh, that we've been called to do. So the next survey question was, how comfortable are you with the referrals you are asked to accept? 70% of the providers responding said that they're usually comfortable with referrals, although occasionally they're asked to serve outside the scope. About 4% said that they're uncomfortable uh, with, with how often they're asked to, to accept inappropriate referrals. And about 20% said they're very comfortable. So that indicates either that the relationship is very strong between the referral sources and the crisis program, or the crisis program is, uh, is very uh, confident and consistent in what type of services they provide, and that the community at large or the referral sources really understand uh, and, and respect kind of the, the function of the program. So we asked a question along with this, in what situations are you not comfortable accepting a referral? And uh, a few answers to that were, when the core service agency asked that a client who is psychiatrically stable be held for several weeks or months. 
And uh, one of our providers from Kansas said at times in Kansas, there are no appropriate options. For example, there is a moratorium with our state hospital and we have multiple people in the community waiting to get admitted. So for some providers, you don't have much control in your organization over the continuum. You might only provide a crisis uh, stabilization program, perhaps some case management, uh, but maybe another organization operates the mobile crisis team or the, the crisis line. Um, but then there are some that, that have strong control over those continuums. And in those cases, uh, you can often be less um, subject to the changes that are happening in the community because you're more in control of some of those aspects. But in a case where there's a, a state hospital moratorium or, or hospital beds are shutting down, um, they can they can be really, um, uh, it can be really challenging because you're being asked to do something different than what you were, you were asked to do before. So the next question was, again, in what situations are you not comfortable accepting a referral? Uh, medically complex individuals was a response that we got from a number of people. Um, also violent or aggressive clients, uh, people who are experiencing homelessness, and anyone requiring one-to-one -one monitoring. One of the programs that I interviewed in the last few months uh, actually had a stipulation or a requirement that said that they had, that the person that they were serving needed to have stable housing before they were admitted into the crisis program. Uh, the reason for that being their crisis program was very short term, uh, maybe like a three to five day length of stay, and it wasn't a sustainable uh, or helpful option for that person to bring them in somewhere wh when the the end of their stay was only going to result in chaos. Now, I've heard of a lot of other differing opinions, especially in the survey results that we've had today, uh, that say, well, that's not exactly how we, um, you know, how we look at it, or you know, we want to be helpful, and maybe a psychiatric issue uh, and a homelessness issue go hand in hand. So, if we can address the psychiatric issue, um, think of how much we might be able to help someone. So, there, there's a lot of different. Um, uh, approaches or schools of thought um, in that sense. Our next question is, do you feel that your referral sources understand the scope of your program, such as length of stay, treatment offered, and uh, resources available? Again, about almost 80% of our respondents said referral sources sometimes under misunderstand the scope of our program. Uh, such as length of stay and type of treatment offered and client restrictions. Um, a few of the quotes that came out of there were that w one, one manager said they believe we do case management and we'll find people housing. Uh, another said often the local EDs send us clients that are not in crisis but need housing options or similar non-emergent issues. And then another said that there's a lot of misunderstanding about length of stay. Clients are only authorized to stay three to seven days. And I know as a provider, this can start to um, make you want to probably bang your head against the wall eventually when you run into the same problem week after week from the same providers, um, you know, whether it's new staff, seasoned staff, um, they don't exactly understand your program. And I want to take a minute and, um, and ask Lindsay Martin uh, from Hope Network in Grand Rapids, Michigan to talk just for a few minutes about some of the proactive ways that you have, that, that your crisis homes have gotten the message out to your referral sources, but also maintain that message. So not just kind of in a one time, but, but how have you sustained those meaningful relationships and, and as a part of that, made sure that people understand uh, what your program is about and, and like what are acceptable admission criteria or, you know, just any of those nuances. So Lindsay, I'm wondering if you could talk to us for a little while about, uh, about that experience. And again, just make sure to hit star six before you, uh, if you're calling in from the phone. Well, I don't know if it's working. So I think we're, Lindsay, if you're talking right now, you're probably muted. Um, oh, but hi, this is Lindsay. Hey, I had to Lindsay, hit start six a couple times. <laughs> hi, I'm not sure why I didn't come through the first time, but yeah, thank you. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, if that's something 
but certainly at our program in Grand Rapids, Pivot Crisis, we've seen be hugely beneficial for being referred people that we can serve. Um, I liked what you said earlier about there being a dynamic tension at times between referral sources and crisis residential programs. And I think that's healthy on both sides because um, in some ways it challenges us to look at who is being referred and so we need to challenge ourselves to meet the community's needs. Um, but in other ways we need to be able to say, have a boundary about what we can and can't do um, and what we really specialize in. And so what we've done at Pivot that's been pretty successful is something we call the dog and pony show, but it's every six months to a year with every major group that refers to our program to do an in-person presentation at their team meetings, which of course can be challenging to schedule because team meetings are so, that's such valuable time for agencies, but going in front just kind of doing a really initial high level overview of what crisis residential is, um, talking about any changes that have come up in the last six months to a year since we've been at that referring agencies meeting, um, reviewing if there's been any trend of inappropriate referrals um, and providing some feedback about um, how that could have gone differently and asking if there's any questions or concerns. So pretty basic standing agenda for those. Um, but it gets the leaders for the program in front of the people who are making referrals, which helps with developing and maintaining those relationships. So if there is an issue or a question, the folks in the room know who to call or who to reach out to um, and have met them before, but <clears throat> also just keeps the consistent message um, about who we are and what we do and troubleshooting specific issues we've had in either direction with each agency to keep those lines of communication open. So that's in terms of the, and still, I mean, that has helped a lot, but we also, you know, still sometimes get referrals for people that it's not the most appropriate setting, and we have to work through those day by day as they come in, but it certainly has significantly reduced those. Um, and when the referrals do come up that aren't the best fit, we have those relationships formed where we can work through those in a non-adversarial way. That's great, Lindsay. I'm wondering, could you actually talk about what seems like a, a nice side benefit of that, which is getting your, um, your, your team, your staff, more invested in kind of the, uh, you know, the outward facing part of your program and getting them off site and, and having them do things that uh, help to invest in your image or your, your marketing approach. What kind of effect has that had on uh, your um, uh, on, on the people that you send out to go to those team meetings as far as like their understanding of the system or their confidence or their ownership in uh, in the program that they work in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, customer service is such a huge part of anything any of us do in any of our types of programs. Um, but you certainly you want staff who are going out and doing those types of presentations to have an understanding about, you know, for sustainability of a program, we need referrals so that the program can stay open and, um, and continue to serve people who need the care. And I think, you know, I'm not sure what the magic equation is for that, but I think just continually in team meetings and one-on-one -on -one meetings with staff talking about what our purpose is and, um, when in team meetings we're talking about what our challenges are, being able to identify um, how important those relationships are and coaching on maintaining relationships with external entities because those are so crucial. Sometimes, um, you mentioned earlier, Travis, sometimes it can feel really frustrating when you're dealing with similar issues with the same referral source over and over again. Um, and it's easy for those to become kind of adversarial at times. So it's just constant and ongoing, consistent feedback from leaders, I think, to, to model that we have to be positive and proactive in our communication and also that even if we're frustrated, creating t further tension in relationships with referral sources is a against the greater need, the, our greater purpose, which is serving people. So um, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question, but those are my thoughts on that. Thank you, Lindsay. I really appreciate it, and I love your um, your dog and pony show reference. Um, I, I, yeah, that, it sounds like a really great uh, great way to explain it. Does anyone have any questions for Lindsay about some of those uh, initiatives that she's been able to implement at her program?
Okay, cool. Thank you, Lindsay. Appreciate uh, the the input and insight on onto some of those uh, things you guys are doing in your program. Very cool. Thank you. Okay, so our next uh, question was about uh, about if you're ever asked to compromise your program standards as a part of uh, you know, being a, a provider in your, in your system. So the question was, are there instances where you feel like you're asked to compromise the integrity of your program or your guidelines by accepting people who don't meet the established medical criteria for admission? I think this is one of the most interesting slides uh, of, of our entire uh, time together today. 62% of you said yes. There are times where we're asked to, to to work outside of our scope or to do more than what we're expected to do. And I don't mean that from like a, a working hard perspective, but like a, uh, you know, taking a client that we wouldn't normally take or taking someone that needs 24 hour care uh, with nursing or one to one supervision when we just don't have the staffing to do that or, or, or it's not a, you know, it's not part of what we're typically asked to do. Um, so a few of the respondents responses in there were uh, being asked to provide medical detox with when the unit may not be licensed to do so, um, allowing clients to stay for four months due to housing at the request of the county. Uh, and then another person said, recently we have assisted an IDD adult that is monitor that is transitioning from home placement to an IDD group home that has experienced a, a mental health crisis. So one thing that might might happen in your state is uh, oftentimes certain services can be separated from one another and so for example the licensing requirements in a crisis residential program uh, might be completely different than the licensing requirements in a uh, an SUD treatment program you know we, we recognize the prevalence of uh, comorbid conditions and the importance of being able to to dynamically treat individuals who are experiencing both um, but a lot of times our, our policies at, at the state level or our licensing, our regulations, haven't kind of caught up to that idea. And so um, that might be the topic of a future uh, conversation, um, but you know, it's, 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 it can be challenging when you as a provider want to do that, when you want to provide that service or you want to extend and expand your services to, to really meet the needs of the people that are coming through your front door, um, and yet you've got uh, systems kind of working against you um, uh, in, in, in those in those ways. So some more input on uh, compromising program standards. Uh, one person wrote, our program director has no input on who is accepted into our crisis house. The determination for admission rests solely on the crisis workers assessment of the client and who at most times are not QMHPs. So meaning that they're getting referrals, and this I think this was the one of our, our new participants from Hawaii. They said, our program director has no input on who's accepted. So it's it's a complete like linear contract relationship that doesn't doesn't allow itself for variance or or really for denials, um, and that the referral sources don't even work at the crisis home or don't have any affiliation with a crisis home um, and might not have the education that they need in order to make uh, these determinations. Um, another person said at times hospitals refer clients when they have nowhere else to send them and it can be a stretch to meet our level of medical criteria. You know I think that's a, a, a stressor for anybody that works in a, an emergency department is we get people or you know we're, we're tasked with putting people in, in places that we don't know where they need to go. Um, I, I, I thought that maybe a lot of people could relate to this picture that we have on the slide, right? Where um, you're out like at a, at a lunch or you're taking a walk, you know, you're finally getting outside for the first time after like six hours of triaging crises that are happening on a Friday and you just want to go and, and get, you know, food from wherever you like to go get food from and your phone blows up and you get calls and then right then you're asked to make a decision or you're getting pressure from um, from a referral source to say like we really need to take this admission or um, 
as we'll talk about in one of the next slides, maybe your boss is calling and says, um, I, w I heard that you denied an admission. No, we need to take this because we need to keep good relations with our referral sources or with our community mental health organization or you know whoever it is. Um, uh, it, it can leave you feeling pretty powerless and frustrated uh, to be in those situations where you're trying to uphold certain clinical standards or program standards and then uh, you know being being told a different story or, or not having a lot of, uh, of say in the matter. So next we'll talk about program integrity and here we have a picture of a doctor right who um, is is very upset and, and just knows what's best for anybody that comes through the doors no claims to know your program better than you do. Um, I get the sense from this picture that like He's he's angry, but he's also disappointed in you, um, in the way that like you know like a, a like a, a parent like thinks that you should know better than to deny uh, some a referral source. Uh, you know I'm I'm the doctor like I, I know what I'm doing here right. Um, so the question we asked was have you have you dealt with any consequences for denying admissions from any of your referral sources? And one person said there's fewer referrals that they've gotten as a result. Um, this was one of my favorites. Hospital doctors are angry and calling executive director to get his way. And then they say it didn't work, um, which is encouraging, right? Um, and then experiencing pushback from the local EDs because they want you to take the, the most challenging people coming from their, their uh, uh, from, from the ED. And then we don't, one, one program said we do not deny admissions. We can almost always come to a creative solution to serve them. And I think that that's an interest. You're, you're, you're hopefully starting to pick up on some of the the, the contrasts here in approach. Um, but when we had Steve Fields on our call from uh, from San Francisco back, I believe in February or March, you know, he spoke about how their programs at the Progress Foundation started because they would take anyone. Right? They would. They would. They made themselves relevant to their community, to San Francisco General Hospital, to to whoever else. That if they didn't have beds at, at those places, they could send their referrals to the Progress Foundation. And it was like we want to serve people, and we don't care, uh, you know, what their level of acuity is. But yet, as he shared, there were so many instant. There, there were so few instances of issues that happened that they were able to stabilize, and ultimately that they were able to demonstrate relevance uh, and, and a, a helpful uh, service to their community. Um, our last quote here says that there's times that community partners don't understand why we simply increase our medical staff, why we can't simply increase our medical staffing to accommodate high acuity medical clients. And I, I imagine this happens with a lot of you um, that perhaps you're already short staffed and it's pretty ambitious to think that you could um, uh, you know, suddenly bring in more staff like just they appear from the sky. Um, and if you need them, then suddenly they're there. Uh, you might have a, a staffing crisis going on pretty regularly. So the idea of doubling up staffing on a, an individual is, is really ambitious. Um, and that might go back to a wages issue. That might go back to a, a, you know, a systems issue of having programs adequately funded so you can pay people. Uh, there's a lot of pieces that can, go, that can certainly go into that. Okay, more words, um, as I said earlier. So how do you balance your desire to be a helpful provider in your community's care continuum uh, with maintaining the functional integrity of your program, right? So you want to be helpful. You want to meet the community need. You want to be there for people. But how do you also maintain your integrity so that you're not suddenly, um, you know, serving a, a, a population that has, has high medical needs, um, maybe uh, needs 24-hour surveillance, maybe needs help with ambulatory care, uh, and, and, and you don't have the staffing to do that. So this, this was a great first, uh, uh, the, the first quote here is really interesting. So we enjoy growing the program to be able to competently serve as many as we can. We enjoy filling gaps and thinking outside the box, but we will not do what we cannot do, and we will not take on something that is above the risk we can manage. That sounds like a really healthy and like centered response. I really like that. It's like, the, you know, we are we want to be good at something. You know, we want to have this specialization, or we want to be helpful and grow in our helpfulness. But we're not going to make a promise that we can't deliver on, or we're not going to, you know, uh, 
um, go into a space that's just that that's uh, too ambitious. You know, how many times as a provider does it feel like you're just trying to help somebody else uh, rid themselves of a problem that they have in their day? You know, so let's say it's a an access center that calls you and says we've got this referral they don't really meet medical criteria I had this happen once I can't remember if I've mentioned it before but I, I was on the phone and I had a clinician um, give someone a diagnosis on the spot you know like a psychotic disorder NOS or a depressive disorder NOS just so that they could meet criteria to get into our program right that's just that's not that's that's not um, accountable care when it feels like they're doing more to just get a problem off of their desk or you know be able to move on or be able to go home because it's the end of their shift um, than it does to, to do what's right for the person being served or to honor the the program uh, you know uh, parameters uh, that have been set and agreed upon in contracts so um, yeah, I will. The, the next one talks about reevaluating the program scope, and I think that's important to ask every every you know maybe couple years. Um, in this case, they said that the opiate epidemic had kind of forced them to do that; that they needed to be more adaptable. Um, so I did want to open this question up for a minute um, and, and and talk a little bit about the the opioid epidemic. Um, to what extent has it affected your programs, and uh, it, has it felt like the, the changes or adaptations that you've had to make related to SUD treatment, have they felt manageable? Have they felt challenging? Um, I just want to open that question up for a couple minutes to the group and, and find out like what your experiences are and, and how much you're being drawn into this and if you're uh, sitting on committees or work groups or if your crisis programs are being asked to, to be included in this question or uh, you know just I'm really curious to hear about dynamics. So um, if you want to ch chime in, feel free to hit star six on your phone, uh, but would love to hear about crisis programs experiences right now uh, uh, relevant or pertaining to the opioid epidemic. Maybe we can start with this question. Um, what are you noticing now in your programs uh, from the perspective of, of opiate use and uh, what are you doing or what is your community doing about it right now? I have uh, a comment. Great. This is Carrie from NetCare in Columbus, Ohio. If you were talking, I, I lost some audio there, but I think we were talking about the effect of the opiate em epidemic on um, our crisis residential programs. That's right. In uh, Columbus, um, our, um, our crisis stabilization unit has been really affected. Um, um, our crisis stabilization unit is kind of like an inpatient unit, and the crisis crisis only area is kind of like an emergency room so the the crisis area the emergency room kind of thing um, refers people to our crisis stabilization unit for uh, the crisis stabilization unit program the problem is we're getting so many people who have primary opiate uh, uh, dependency who are waiting for a detox bed that we're getting a lot of um, our program beds being kind of taken over for um, opiate uh, uh, folks waiting for opiate detox. And so when people are in opiate withdrawal, they do not want to participate in the program. They don't want to participate in group. They're sick. They're, we try to make them as comfortable as possible. But they don't stay with us very long because we, it might be just an overnight stay. And so um, our clients are churning through really fast. And so it means that what when we used to have a full unit of 10 people who would be there for, you know, five or six days, four or five or six days, and we'd get some really good group milieu uh, going. Now we have people churning pretty fast, and so the milieu isn't as good for those who are in the program. So that's, that's how it's affecting us. Um, the good news is we're getting more people hooked up with um, 
detox and uh, SUD programming in other agencies, but it's 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 really kind of taking over our crisis stabilization unit. And, and Carrie, what kind of effect um, is that having? Like, we talked last month about funding, right? About and and about uh, funding in the future if it's not already being tied to outcomes, like process measures like group attendance or uh, you know like interaction with treatment teams or outcomes right. measures so right. what what kind of effect is that having on on group attendance it's, and other like ways of participation and is that are you being like uh, scrutinized for how that the people that you're bringing in there could affect some of those numbers yeah exactly well if um, we have um most of our rooms, people share, so they're, they're either doubles or triples. We have a couple single rooms. But if your roommate is uh, dope sick, that makes you want to leave the CSU faster, even if you're not dope sick. But if your roommate is dope sick, it's pretty scary. And if there's a, a group that should be a group of eight or nine people and it's a group of four people, it doesn't have the same... Uh, the same richness of the program in the group counseling. And because our staff is involved in, in high intensity, low productivity uh, work, such as um, um, hooking people up with detox programs or hooking people up with um, um, SUD treatment elsewhere, um, uh, our productivity as a department has gone down. Now everybody knows why this is happening, and nobody's, you know, giving us a hard time. But it's um, the 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 quality of the program is suffering, and the uh, the productivity, what we're earning, is suffering also. So that's that's kind of a challenge. So we're looking at: Do we want to become a primary SUD treatment center, and what would that mean? And you know, uh, would we do detox? Would we not do detox? Do we need to completely change from a mental health uh, primary focus to an SUD primary focus? So that's a, that's a challenge. Wow. So some real uh, scope considerations there. Um, right. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate that. Um, Rebecca Botter, who uh, works at Pathways uh, in Kentucky, uh, typed in, we are impacted greatly as recently we are seeing more than 50% of our referrals dealing with SUD as well as mental health. And then another challenge is that we have a non-medical detox within the same building, but the rules are different, which creates barriers for consumers and staff. We are currently looking at ways to combat this issue. Thank you, Rebecca, for sharing that. Um, does anyone else want to weigh in and share about their experiences? And again, remember, if you are talking right now, we pro we can't hear you because it, uh, you probably haven't hit star six on your phone. So I'll give you just a couple more seconds if that is that is your case. Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay, great. Um, the next question says, do you ever experience internal conflict in your organization over accepting a referral? If so, how is that managed? Uh, this was interesting. One person said, often our frontline staff feel that our licensed clinicians and or management staff are accepting referrals that are not a good fit. Um, and, you know, there's an interesting paradigm that can exist between direct care providers, peer support specialists, and, uh, and clinicians. And everybody has a different approach and different experiences that have informed where they come from. Um, and sometimes those things can come into conflict and it might be a, a you know it might be that you have to have a master's degree or a, a clinical license in order to make that kind of decision um, but the frontline staff are the ones that are there 24 7 and are really in tune and understanding of what the past uh, clients were like that they served and how that informs what they you know how they can project or how they can understand what future clients are going to look like. So I wonder to what extent programs can uh, engage their um, uh, engage their direct care providers 
in some of those uh, conversations. Maybe not hand, handing the decision making over to them completely, um, but helping to have their approach or their perspective informed uh, into the in, into the decision. So another person said that there is some internal conflict. Um, another group said that all questionable referrals are forwarded through management and that there's, they're a very large agency and have countless team members to rely on for informed decisions. So that's pretty cool to be able to have, uh, you know, a lot of people to bounce ideas off of and say, hey, let's, you know, let's bring this to someone else or let's bring this to someone on the other side of the state uh, that is, um, you know, that, that, that could give us some insight on this. Next question says, what is your perception of how a crisis program like yours complements the continuum of services in your community? Uh, this was one of the uh, responses, this is one of the, the most heavily responded to questions that we had. Uh, one person said, crisis units are just that for people in behavioral health crisis, including when their environment becomes unstable. Um, another said, person-centered treatment involves treating the whole person. Um, I liked the, the efforts that this one crisis center had, had mentioned about getting their staff well-versed in community resources, having on-site support with SOAR, which is um, assistance with, with uh, social security applications, uh, with a homeless team and site sobering detox. So it sounds like this agency really tried to meet uh, the needs of the people and, and, and meeting their clients where they were at and saying, you know, just providing medications and groups isn't sufficient, that, that we want to provide some real meaningful help. Um, an, another program said that their, their crisis program is a catch-all for the community, that they're in a great position to help. They can't do everything, but they do everything in their power to change lives for, for, for the better. Um, our next question said, how are you motivated or incentivized to take non-traditional referrals? I know this sounds like, uh, you know, how do you motivate your kids to eat their breakfast? Or, you know, how do you motivate your dog to get in the car to go to the vet? Um, and, and for many of you, uh, there is not an incentive built in. Um, you know, uh, increased staffing ratios or increased pay um, aren't always an option. As a matter of fact, increased pay was the least uh, had, had the, the lowest response. Um, and two thirds of the program said there are no incentives available, but we're still expected to take non-traditional referrals. So very interesting that it's, it's kind of like a um, just, just deal with it maybe kind of approach. Um, and that can be exhausting, right? Because you are functioning in many ways as many hospitals. You're taking people who have a high level of acuity, who are in crisis, um, and you're doing it on a day-to-day -day basis, and then to be asked every once in a while to do even more than that, um, it can it can feel pretty overwhelming. One person said, at our crisis stabilization unit, we take clients who are waiting for detox beds. These are short stays for individuals who don't participate in groups. Our productivity is down because of this. And I, I wonder if this was Carrie. I, there, I bet there's a good chance that it was, but if it wasn't, then somebody else is also um, experiencing this. Okay, more of the words. Um, so this says, how has your crisis program adapted over the years and its function as part of the safety net? Um, I, I do wanna actually feature one of our uh, participants and that is in the third response here about the alumni program. Um, Mendy, I, I think that we've had you talk about the alumni program before, but I think it's worth coming back to because it just sounds so great and, and, and I love what you say here about how you're meeting the needs of these individuals in your community. So um, I wonder if you could take a couple minutes and talk to us about how you've been engaging your alumni and kind of what kind of results you've seen from that. I, th I think in many respects our alumni program, and these are folks who have uh, successfully completed our program, and in many cases other requirements, for example, They've had to go through residential substance use treatment uh, or, or other uh, requirements that our staff impose, but they're voted on by the staff as a whole, and that is from direct care all the way to the medical director and me. Um, and so it's a, a big deal to become an alumni. And we allow our alumni to hang out here um, they can take showers here, they can take meals here, 
Um, they can attend group here, and they can receive counseling services from us as our schedules permit when they have a need. We also try to provide them with some case management assistance as needed. And in exchange for that, they are an invaluable contributors to our current residents. They assist people by helping them find various locations for linking to service. They'll actually ride the bus with people and help them get to Social Security office uh, and other uh, eye care clinics, all sorts of other services that are in the community and sometimes can be very challenging to reach. Uh, they also just provide emotional support to our residents, encouragement, um, installation of hope, all of those kinds of things. Uh, and one of the neatest features of our alumni program is what happens on holidays. I think last Thanksgiving was our record. Uh, we had 120 alumni here for the Thanksgiving holiday. And they join us in sort of a, it's a family event. These are folks who don't have other families. And we're maybe not the best substitute in the world, but we're all they got. Um, so I, I can't emphasize enough how many incidents of crisis we have helped people avoid by offering this simple little service. Folks are allowed to stay here from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. Um, seven days a week. And just having a place to go seems to make a very big difference to many of our clients who are some really sick folks who are extremely disenfranchised in our community. We, we're a large community with few supports for our client base who are indigent, uninsured, and underinsured folks. Mandy, I love what you said. Uh, thank you so much. I, and, and something that stuck with me that you said was that it's a big deal to become an alumni at your program. I think that I, I love that you're embracing, um, uh, you know, transition and 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 uh, the people's end of of stay at your program as a success and as like something to be proud of as an accomplishment. Um, I, I'm wondering uh, if you could talk about the impact that. Um, that feeling is having on your alumni and how it affects their um, their self-worth, their self-esteem to be in that position where they can kind of uh, in a generative way um, offer their experiences to other people. It's interesting when our client when our alumni are out applying for jobs, one of the things that they proudly indicate <laughs> very often in in employment applications is that they're alumni of this program. Um, we get asked often to write letters of reference for folks because they're proud to be associated with our program. I, I think I don't know how you calculate really the way that uh, being a member of a group like this boosts someone's um, self-esteem or sense of self-worth. But I think you know the proof is in the pudding. They they come back year after year after year. We have a guy who graduated from this program 11 years ago, who comes back here uh, frequently to run a P11 meeting for our residents and other community members. Uh, P11 being a, a type of Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, um, and one of the things he talks about frequently is how important his alumni status is. Um, we've had a few occasions where folks have lost their alumni status by coming here impaired. And it is a very big deal to get it back. The entire staff meets with them. We interview them. Um, and getting the alumni status reinstated by um, maybe documenting 90 meetings in 90 days or uh, documenting uh, several months of attendance at DBSA meetings, 
uh, that's a big deal to our alumni population. So I, I'm, I hope I've answered the question effectively. But it, it, it seems to enhance self-esteem. And that's evidenced by the fact that people talk about it as a badge of honor. Thank you, Mendy. I have 100 questions and only four minutes left on our call. But I, I did want to ask one question that people might be asking, which is, how do you address um, uh, uh, concerns about like HIPAA or privacy with past um, clients uh, seeing current clients at a crisis program? We never disclose anybody's name. But if an individual resident here chooses to disclose his or her name to an alumni, then um, you know that's their business, and that's not a HIPAA violation. Um, I, I think I think there is an underlying concern, uh, a legitimate concern about that. Um, for my part, I have chosen to assume that risk in the service of our residents and our alumni. So if somebody's name happens to get spoken, um, then it does. We, you know, we're, the way that our unit is set up, it is in a building where there are several other programs. We share a patio area with our PATH Homeless Outreach Program. and. We share space with our mobile crisis outreach team. So there is a lot of activity, lots of different clients from different programs, present and past, who walk through this facility every day. It would be absurd for me to tell you that we are 100 percent HIPAA compliant because we are just not. And I don't know how we could be, to be really honest with you. Thank you, Mandy. I, I appreciate your transparency and your honesty about that. And um, I think that you know whatever whatever risks you might um, approach in in trying to, uh, by, by by having alumni there, um, the benefits would would far outweigh that. And I think that there's a lot to learn about your program in the interest of, of system change and, and really addressing loneliness in the community. You know, um, there are medications for depression, but there are not medications for, uh, for loneliness or for community inclusion. And so uh, you know, I think that you're providing a, a huge need that a lot of our communities would benefit from. And I imagine it's having a significant impact on uh, recidivism and readmission rates. So thank you so much for sharing that information. Our outcomes support that. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so just the last couple slides here as we as we end our call today. Um, we asked, have funder requirements or expectations caused you to change how services are provided? Um, only 42% said, said yes. Uh, shorter length of stay was a, a result of some of those funder requirement changes. And I know that uh, some of the providers in Michigan have experienced that, where five or 10 years ago, a seven to 14 day length of stay was pretty common. And now you're talking about maybe a four to seven day length of stay at certain programs. Uh, but I've also heard different health plans uh, uh, say get, provide different answers to that question as well. Um, some of them have said, uh, you know, we think that we want to get people in and out as quick as possible. Others have said we want to make sure that the stay is effective and helpful, and so we don't mind paying for a couple extra days uh, if that's going to decrease the uh, the recidivism rate. Um, just a couple announcements. Uh, SAMHSA is continuing to host these webinars on trauma informed innovations and crisis services. Uh, I've attended a couple of them. I think they're fantastic. Uh, the next one is Monday, July 24th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, if you follow the link that I've given you right there, uh, that will kind of take you there um, and get the information for the next uh, couple of calls. Our next conference call is scheduled for Wednesday, August 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern, um, 11 a.m. Pacific. We don't have a topic yet for that. If you have ideas on what you'd like to talk about, um, please let me know. And then our call after that will be on Friday, September 15th. 
A uh, reminder, if you have questions you want to email out to the group, uh, go to Crisis Residential Network at tbdsolutions.com. Our meeting slides are stored on our website, and we now also have uh, mo many of our conference calls on our YouTube page, so make sure to check that out. If you have any questions, my email address is listed on the bottom there. Uh, thank you so much for participating, and we will talk again next month. Have a good one.